I've heard. And cubs are so small in size and extremely endearing, so they're kept as pets. And of course, that's illegal. Now, the story is about Wong's love of animals and how it leads him to pursue an unconventional and sometimes dangerous career. Now, Sunshine Coast local and USC lecturer Sarah Pai takes readers on a journey of discovery where the audience is introduced to individual sun bears that she's come to know. They are Natalie, who learns to survive without her mother. Bong Kud, who's struck by lightning. Guttuck, who's too scared to go outside. And Debbie, who grabs her chance at freedom. Saving bears is Wong's story and theirs. The rainforest in Borneo is a very special place. It's just filled with life. Clean air, clean water, and stable climate come from the forest. But this amazing place is slowly disappearing. Sun bear live in tropical rainforest in South Asia. They play very important roles that keep the forest healthy and everything in balance. But the forest in Southeast Asia has been widely deforested. And they face a lot of threat from hunting and poaching. Sun bears are in deep trouble. I grew up by rescuing birds and so on. I study wildlife biology and I met a professor. He was looking for a Malaysian student to do a study on sun bear. I said, hey, I'm your man. When I first started, no one has ever studied sun bears. The more I learn about them, the more I care. The more I care, the more I worry. I have to help them. Okay, let's get started. So this is the portion for chin. I established the center to ensure the survival of the sun bear. Breakfast is served. We have 44 sun bears brought in for various reasons, including people keeping them as illegal pets. So this is Mary. Most people call me Papa Bear, but I want bears to live in the forest and not in captivity. Yeah, open up the door 11 right now. Number one is out. Number two, three. The bears spend their daytime in the forest enclosure, ready to explore the forest and have a a lot of happy hours. They learn to forage, to climb tree, getting themselves ready to be released and survive in the forest one day. Where do they sleep? Spend time here, you'll see the bears sleep on top of the tree. When I see visitors excited about the sun bears, I feel like a proud father. The sun bears is climbing the tree. They can climb 50 meters above the ground. People can see how special is the sun bear and learn about how their survivals are important to ours. Good boy. Yeah, I know. You are a good boy. I'm very humble of serving the sun bears, but my ultimate goal is everybody can live harmoniously together in the planet we call home. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you found that video as heartwarming as I did. My name is Sarah Pai, and I've written this book about Dr. Wong Su Ti's life. It's called Saving Sun Bears, and we launched it on Friday at World Environment Day. It was the, one of the first um, uh, pro thing on the program for this week, this uh, three-day program that we've had. It was such an amazing event, and if you haven't managed to watch the launch, you're very welcome to do so. You can do so as a um, on a catch-up at wed.org.au. You can catch up on Friday's program and listen to an interview with Dr. Wong, myself and the publisher about how we actually came about um, creating and launching this book. 
So I'd very much like to encourage you to do that. We're going to hear from Dr. Wong in a few minutes. I'm going to introduce him and tell you a little bit about his experience in the Bornean rainforest. I'll be uh, telling you, or he'll be telling you about biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity. But before we do that, I'm going to read a little bit from the book for you, just so you can get a little taste of this while we're making sure that Dr. Wong is available. So I'm going to read um, from a chapter, chapter 14. Chapter 14 is called Bonkut, Coco and Gutuk. And you heard a little about them in, uh, in Rosanna's introduction. This, by the way, is a picture of Mary. She was mentioned in the video that we just saw. The sky was heavy with cloud and the humid air was completely still. The organic smell of hummus wafted from the forest floor heavy on the senses and the sky darkened. Heat was trapped under the platform and even Ronnie, acclimatized to the tropics, was sweating heavily as he worked. Sensing imminent rain, the bears started to play. Bonkut scampered up a tree next to the observation platform, higher and higher. She swayed back and forth, practicing her wild bear skills. Out of the corner of his eye, Ronnie could see her climb. Such an independent bear, she was becoming self-sufficient often building sleeping nests high in the trees and finding her own food by shredding termite-infested logs on the forest floor. It wouldn't be long before she would be able to return to the wild habitat where she belonged. What a different bear she was from that day in 2012 when she arrived at the center with signs of severe malnourishment, sores on her head from rubbing her small cage in an effort to escape. Damai, a fastidiously clean bear, wandered around the buttress roots at the base of the huge dipterocarp tree, which dominated the rainforest pen, as she decided which trunk to attempt. She could smell the rain coming and wanted to get away from the impending mud and join in the fun above, before irritating mosquitoes squashed between the pads of her paws. Ronnie felt a sense of unease and called up, Bonkut, Bonkut, go back, go back to the bear house, go back. But like a bulletproof teenager, she was oblivious to any danger, testing her boundaries. Suddenly, a wind came out of nowhere, creating a cacophony as it slalomed through the forest, branches colliding in its wake. A powerful lightning bolt a short distance away shook the ground where Ronnie sheltered, causing him to catch his breath in surprise. He didn't have time to take action before a second bolt struck. This time it was much closer and deafening. In a split second, he took in the scene. Damai and four other bears were running for the bear house. Then, instantly, everything around Ronnie was whitewashed in bright light as the metal that supported the platform structure lit up like a fireball. His vision was gone. It was just like I saw white paper, he remembers. In the quarantine area 50 meters away, all the metal bars glowed as electricity coursed through them. The bear's ears pricked up in fear at the intense impact as a huge, hundred-year-old dipterocarp tree suffered a direct hit. The deafening crack could be heard from the office, but an adult orangutan shaking, taking shelter in the eaves restricted the staff from investigating. It took, Ronnie a few, it took Ronnie's vision a few moments to return, and slowly, as the blood rushed to his optic nerve, the whitewash turned red. All the hairs on his arms were on end. He reached for the stainless steel post next to him but recoiled from the heat. The outside skin of the big tree was shredded, exposing its inner skeleton. Flakes of bark rained down. The mandatory rubber boots, which probably saved his life, were as warm as if they had been left in the midday sun. Time suspended and Ronnie was so dazed he totally forgot about the bears. It felt like 15 minutes before reality hit. He reached for the walkie-talkie on his belt and radioed the staff. The acrid smell of burning hair accosted his nostrils and he assumed it was his own. Welcome to Borneo. This dense rainforest acts as the lungs of our planet. It is also home to the threatened Malayan sun bear. Adult sun bears are killed for their gallbladder and paws, ingredients in Chinese medicine. Traumatized orphaned cubs are abandoned or sold into the illegal pet trade. 
Dr. Wong, the Malaysian founder of the Bornean Sun Bear Conservation Center, is on a quest to save the world's smallest bear from extinction and release rescued bears back into the wild. Join Australian author Sarah Pai on a heartwarming journey through his extraordinary life and meet Sun Bear characters who owe him their freedom. This is his story and theirs. As you can tell from the book that um, that I've written and of Wong's life, the video that we watched first, Wong has had an extraordinary life. He has trapped munjacks in Taiwan. He has uh, trapped grizzly bears in Montana, studied the Malayan sun bear, the exclusive Malayan sun bear in Borneo and created the Bornean Sun Bear Conservation Center. Wong calls himself an ecologist or a tropical ecologist, and he knows way more about the rainforest than just Borneo. So today I'm, I'm absolutely honored to introduce you to my colleague and friend, Dr. Wong Su Ti, who's going to share his knowledge about the rainforest in Borneo and the biodiversity there. How are you today, Wong? Good. I'm really, really good. Good to see you here. And uh, yeah, good to have everybody here yes, as well. It's been two whole days since we've seen you, Wong. So it's, um, it's lovely to see you again. Um, yes. So as I said, Wong has an extraordinary n amount of knowledge about the Bornean rainforest after spending so long in it. I'd like to ask you, Wong, if you would share your knowledge about um, sun bears and their importance to the rainforest and the biodiversity in Borneo. Yeah, I think, you know, from all the years that the study that we have been done, we know that sun bears uh, play many important ecological roles in the rainforest. For example, when they eat fruits, they ingest the seed and then the seed will pass through their digestive tracts. And then uh, when they move around, after a few hours, they start to defecate and then the seed come out from their feces. And that process is called seed dispersal. And seed dispersal is extremely important in the forest ecosystems. One of the reasons is because uh, in, the, in the tropical rainforest of Borneo, you know, everything leaves all year round and the predators, whether they are vertebrate predators or uh, invertebrate predators or fungi or bacteria that prey on that particular mother tree always hang around the mother tree. So for a mother tree per se, they want to uh, find a way to disperse the seed as far as, as far as possible. So sun bear as a large mammal that capable of swallowing large seed can do the work. And then uh, they also can consider as far as doctor because one group of the termite that they are eating is actually attacking live tree. So when sun bear is feeding on these types of uh, termite, they actually control the termite populations uh, to prevent uh, mass killing of you know, many trees by this termite uh, species. And then uh, sun bears is also considered as forest engineer when uh, sun bear feed on the stingless beehive on top of the tree they actually excavate a tree cavities to get hold of the uh, honey of, uh, of the stingless bee. And then that cavity is later being used by other uh, species like hornbills or flying squirrels as nests. So they, big, they build nests for, every, for, for, for other species. And then sun bears also act as a forest farmer when they feed on uh, earthworm, for example, they do, the, do a lot of digging the, digging the soil to look for uh, earthworm. And then that process actually like clouding like farmers plowing the soil, so they are considered as forest farmer. And then lately, we also know that they play a very important roles as food provider. After a uh, sun bear is feeding on the decay wood or you know plow the soil looking for earthworm, there's something there's always something left oh, behind. Yeah. So, How are they going so back to me? there are species like um, bearded pigs or pheasant or ground cuckoo or types of ground uh, birds always tag along the bears, and they all got benefits from the sun bear. So sun bear play a very important role in the forest ecosystems. A forest with bears and a forest without bears is a very different forest. So we must make sure that the sun bear live in the forest for a long time. So I need to ask another question, right? That's uh, absolutely fascinating, Wong. Um, so sun bears are a central part of the rainforest and the entire ecosystem. And there's a lot of species, it appears, that rely on sun bears for their existence. But does it work both ways? Are, are there a lot of species in the rainforest um, that rely on sun bears as well? I've heard one thing about this, about the um, 
uh, fig wasp. So maybe you can elaborate on that and how, how the ecosystem works in the rainforest. Yeah, sure, sure. So one uh, types of food, food, food now, yeah, that the sun bear feed on is, is, is fig, is ficus. And then uh, figs are so important to the sun bear's diet and also all of the animals that feed on fruits in the forest because the forests of Borneo, Sumatra and West Malaysia do not fruit in an annual cycle. They fruit in a supra annual cycle. means that if this year fruited, the next fruiting years is four years or six years uh, from this year. So in between, hardly any fruits are available except for fig except for this ficus. And ficus have this very mutual, have this uh, mutualism relationship with fig wasp. It's a type of pollinators that pollinate the fig. Well, figs is uh, flowers, yeah. So when there is no uh, fig wasps come and pollinate the fig fruits, the fig trees will abort the fig when they are still green. So, so it is, you know, this relationship between fig wasps Figs and sun bear is very, very crucial. And then back in 1999, I documented a famine of, uh, of, of the sun bears and bitter pigs in my study area in Borneo. And what happened was that there's no fig fruited in 1999. And then after studies, after readings from other people's studies, and then we found out that the fig was in 1999 at my study area gone locally extinct. And the reason why the fig was extinct is because the El Nino in 1997 and 98, the forest fire, the severe droughts, uh, the haze that created from the forest fire kill off or wipe out the local population of fig wasps. And therefore, there's no fig wasps in my study area in 1999. And then because of that, the fig abort their fruits when it is still green. And therefore, animals that depend on fig to feed on have no food. And when they have no fruit, they starve. Uh, many animals go emaciated, they starve, and even death. There are several the bitter pigs that we recorded in my study area uh, die because of this kind of starvation. So it is a very devastating event, and it shows us that the rainforest uh, of Borneo, although it is green and lush all year round, but it is extremely fragile. You know, a tiny little, little connection that was missing, that was broken, can cause a cascading effect that affects many other species in this forest. So everybody is like interconnected with each other. So the, the, the preserve the integrity of this food web, of this relationship in this forest ecosystem is extremely important. So it, it sounds like a lot of the uh, things that you've spoken of there, Wong, are important everywhere in the world because the Sunshine Coast, we've also got issues with um, uh, global warming. We've got issues with the fires. So it, it's potential, I guess, that we also have species that have, have been wiped out during our recent forest fires that will prove to be essential to the biodiversity of the Sunshine Coast, which, which is a little bit scary for us too, I think. I have another question for you. Um, based on the fact that, that humans have impacted our, our environment and our biodiversity, um, can you share with us ways that you think we as humans can help reverse some of the negative impacts that we've had? And also specifically in, in Borneo, but also um, more globally as well? Yeah, I think uh, that is very important given that we know how important is a tropical rainforest or any any forest so we must first we must protect the existing uh, forest as much as we can you know so if a government if a country needs to generate revenues you know they should not think of from logging or you know selling the timber from a tropical forest or especially the primary forest or any forest at all so we must think of other ways to generate revenues and protect the forest as much as possible. And then second is to support for all of these conservation NGOs or any conservation uh, projects on the ground so that, you know, this group of people who are consistent from experts like ourselves, you know, the Bonin Summit Conservation Center, we are very specialized on sun bear. So support our work, make sure that our work can help. And then uh, at the same time, we need to educate ourselves on the importance 
of this rainforest, of how delicate they are, and, and actually the entire humanity and entire living forms, life form on Earth is all dependent in this very fragile ecosystems. And remember that once this forest is gone, it is gone forever. And say, for example, the forest of Borneo, it is the one of the oldest rainforests in the world. How old? 130 million years. And it is created by time. Yeah, 130 million years. And once this forest is gone, we cannot recreate that types of forest anymore. Yes, we can plant trees, but it will grow very differently or takes a long, long time to reach the stage where, it, they, where, where they are today. And imagine that all these delicate food webs, all these interactions among all the organisms that live in the forest, you know, once it is gone, it is gone. You know, say for example, that the Bonin rainforest have more than 3,000 species of trees. And then uh, in a Bonin, in a Bonin rainforest, one acres of study area have like 6,000 species of insects. And, and this kind of biodiversity is irreplaceable. You cannot recreate it. You know, once it is gone, it is gone. So we must know how precious they are and, uh, and, and we must protect them as much as possible. So, yeah, people can do many, many things. You know, support the governments for this green initiative, support NGOs or working groups that work on particular conservation project, all helps. Very, very true, Wong. Um, that brings me back to, um, it took me back actually to the moment I met you in 2012 when uh, I asked what I could do to help the sun bears and your words were, do what you do best. Those, uh, those powerful words have led me on a seven-year journey and included all sorts of uh, wonderful adventures, including obviously um, this book uh, and, and launching that book with you. So I'd like to thank you very much for allowing me to help you. But to uh, finish off, I'd like to ask you, can you just tell us how people can actually help you? You've got, uh, you've got about one minute to tell us how can people actually help the Bornean Sun Bear Conservation Centre? Okay, sure. You know, people can help us by first go to our website or visit our Facebook. Our website is www.bsbcc.org.my, my, and then uh, from there you can you know donate to us so that our work can be done, and then uh, you can support us by adopting our bears. And then if you have time, be our volunteers. Yeah. And then, uh, and then help us spread the words from our social media, you know, that is all very important. And then uh, finally, you know, like what I told Sarah back in uh, 2012, do what you do best to help us. For sun bears, that is so little known that so many work need to be done. I think everybody, everyone, every profession have a role. Just think of what you do best and I'm sure there is a space for you to help our work and to help Sundares. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wong, very much for joining us from Malaysia today. And thank you to the uh, World Environment Day Council uh, for putting on this amazing event.